Hello everyone, I'm Greg Weaver. Welcome to The Audio Analyst. Today, I want to introduce you to a product that makes a rather bold and interesting departure from typical. The AGD Products Class D Gallium Nitride Transistor-Based Gran Vivace Amplifier. Now, a Class D amplifier, or switching amplifier, all too often mistakenly referred to as a digital amplifier, differs from the much more traditional and popular linear amplifier classes. In a switching amplifier, its transistors, usually MOSFETs, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors, rather than directly providing gain to the sourced signal, operate as electronic switches. Now, the audio input signal is encoded into a pulse train by use of a modulator, much like the AM or FM modulation associated with terrestrial radio, using pulse width, pulse density, or some similar technique to rapidly switch back and forth between the voltage supply rails. The highest frequency pulses are blocked as the audio output passes through a simple low-pass filter and on to the loudspeakers. In this class of operation, efficiency can exceed 90%. Now, theoretically, if perfect components existed, field effect transistor switches with no on resistance and integrating inductors with zero loss, it could be 100% or, or very nearly 100% efficient. Now, most audiophiles think that Class D operation is relatively new, but the first Class D amplifier was invented by British scientist Alec Reeves nearly 70 years ago now, and was the first to be designated as Class D in 1955. Continual development was steady, but slow. In 1964, England's Sinclair Radionics offered a kit module called the X10 with an underwhelming 2.5 watt output. Now, they were able to eventually bump it up to 20 watts by 1966, but the designs were still limited by the inconsistencies and limitations of the germanium-based BJTs, or bipolar junction transistors, that were available at the time. Now, as a result, these early Class D amplifiers were both highly impractical and equally unsuccessful. Now, my friend, the late John Ulrich, who co-founded Infinity Systems with Arnie Nudel in 1968, is considered to have delivered the first successful commercial offering, built to drive his servostatic subwoofer for the Infinity servostatic loudspeaker systems in the early 1970s. The resultant amplifier, which he called the Swamp for switching amplifier, yielded 250 watts per channel and ran at a switching frequency of 500 kilohertz. After leaving Infinity, John founded Spectron and pursued the successful development and manufacture of Class D amplifiers. He was quite successful in winning over music lovers and audiophiles, first with a model called the 1KW in the mid-1990s, then with the Musician series in the late 1990s and early 2000s. In fact, the Musician 2 was my reference amplifier in 2002. Now, sadly, we lost John in May of 2015, uh, coincident with my writing his Profile 4 and just before the publication of 2015's the Absolute Sounds Illustrated History of High-End Audio, Volume 2, Electronics. Now, by the mid-1980s, the availability of low-cost, fast-switching MOSFETs led to an explosion of Class D amplifiers. The first Class D amplifier-based integrated circuit was released by TriPath in 1966, and it saw enormously widespread application. That same year, Hypex Electronics was founded, and under the guidance of Bruno Putzis and others, we saw the development first of UCD, then Encore, and the rest is, as they say, history. Class D amps are used in so many applications today as to be considered almost ubiquitous. 
in TV sets and home theater systems, uh, headphone amplifiers, mobile devices, uh, automotive radios, and many other high volume consumer electronics products. But the audiophile market has remained somewhat resistant, seemingly routinely avoiding high performance class D audio amplification in preference of class AB or class A linear amplifiers. Then a new player arrived on the stage, the gallium nitride transistor. Now, while the first gallium arsenide gate field effect transistor using a Shakti barrier diode to isolate the gate from the channel was demonstrated by Carter Mead in 1966, it was the early 1990s before they were really being actively developed and not until 2010 that the first enhancement mode GAN transistor became generally available. Now, why does the arrival of the GAN transistor matter? Without getting too far off into the weeds, GAN transistors are both significantly faster, about 10 times, and smaller than silicone MOSFETs. They offer five times greater power density than silicon, higher switching frequencies, substantially improved linearity, and remarkably low thermal resistance, enabling efficiency gains that have opened the door to applications and performance not possible with the previously available silicon technology. And Alberto Guerrero, the trailblazer leading the charge at AGD Production of Los Angeles, is leveraging every advantage offered by this technology with his inventive and inspiring designs. Now, the name of this amplifier would seem very fitting. Gran is great in Italian. Did I mention that Alberto was Italian? Vivace is used in reference to tempo, one that is very fast and lively. And both adjectives are extremely appropriate as applied here. This amplifier is, by design, unique. Using a beautifully sculpted base that is just 11 inches by 11 inches square and standing just 5 inches tall, with the approximately 5.5 inch uh, tall GAN tube with its enclosed circuit mounted, the entire assembled amplifier comes to a total height of just about 11 inches. The whole amplifier weighs in at a scant 22 pounds, and this remarkable looking machine develops 400 watts with up to 50 amps of peak current into a 4 ohm load, which is coincidentally the load that my Von Schweikert Audio Ultra 9s present. So why a separate base unit built to accommodate that valve looking glass bottle? Further, just what is that GAN tube I mentioned? According to Alberto, the Gran Vivace base contains the main power supply section, including 70,000 microfarads of power supply capacitance, the analog input buffer stages, the additional linear power supply for the analog section, and various protection and timing circuitry. The KT120-like glass bottle contains the complete gallium nitride output power stage, integrated into what outwardly looks like a vacuum tube. Now, this includes the Class D amplifier module, including its output filter and the linear power supply rails used to feed the pulse width modulation controllers and auxiliary circuits. Now, beyond its elegance and beauty, the utility of this crafty design should be immediately apparent. If or when AGD production finds a way to implement significant improvements, or comes out with a flat-out upgrade to the amplifier circuit itself, users merely need to unplug the current glass bottle containing the existing circuit, then plug in the new upgraded device into the base power supply stage. Not only does this strategy make for an aesthetically gorgeous looking design, but it is also ingeniously practical, providing a simple and cost-effective upgrade path for its owners. The Grand Vivace is simple to install and operate, offering both balanced XLR and single-ended RCA inputs on the far right side of the back panel. Immediately above those inputs is a small recessed port, revealing the input selector switch on the left and a 3.5mm jack to support a 12-volt remote trigger input on the right. The IEC power cable jack and the mains power toggle switch are located to the far left, with a set of WBT speaker binding posts centered. The amps are toggled in and out of standby mode by touching a contact on the top front left corner of the base. Now, 
From the moment these attractive little monoblocks were dropped into my reference system, replacing my nearly twice as expensive reference AudioNet Max monoblocks, they made it clear they weren't fooling around. One of the first attributes to surface was the distinct and complete grip they brandished over my reference Von Schweikert Audio Ultra 9 loudspeakers. Now, given the Grand Vivace's power output and current capability, it will come as no surprise to learn that their ability to control the lowest of bass registers was simply ironclad. Information under 50 Hz, and I mean down into the subsonic regions as low as 16 Hz, was so well defined, articulate, and blisteringly fast that I could really assess no deficiencies as compared to my reference monoblocks. Amplifiers that, as I have stated, sell for nearly twice the Grand Vivace's price. Now, this exceptional low frequency performance is one of the many defining strengths of my Ultra 9s, and these uber lightweight amps were more than merely up to the task. Further along these lines, their ability to present musical scaling, be that orchestral crescendos, prog metal bass or drum attacks, uh, or arena rock uh, walls of sound, it was unparalleled. Their grip on my Ultra 9s was executed seemingly without fault throughout the macrodynamic realm, delivering goosebumps galore with explosively dynamic passages of all genres. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, in the realm of microdynamics, I find them to be just a bit more reticent in their degree of nuance and expressiveness, by way of comparison to the very best performers I've heard in this regard. And while they do sacrifice that final gradation of resolution and articulation as we descend closer to the noise floor, I would be remiss to not point out that those amplifiers that are more adroit here are typically considerably pricier. One interesting exception here comes from the nearly identically priced Parasound JC1 Plus Monos that offer a slight edge in performance over the Grand Vivace in this specific sonic category. Along with their remarkable power and control, they also excel at conveying the speed of instrumental attack, especially notable with stringed instruments from violins to cellos and pianos to harps. This uninhibited sense of rise speed carries over exhibiting an equally impressive ability to render decay and trail. Listening to the attack and decay uh, of ride cymbals from intimate jazz performances, or struck triangles uh, buried deep within classical or even some classic rock or pop compositions, is a treat with the Grand Vivace. Now, concerning their obvious accuracy in recreating spatial information, they once again stand near the head of the class, regardless of price. They just as comfortably and accurately recreate Sting's startling voice appearance off my left shoulder saying good night in the final seconds of When the Angels Fall from the Soul Cages as they solidly position Madonna's ping-ponging vocal expressions of strike a pose, first to the extreme right, then to the extreme left, during the opening of Vogue from the Immaculate Collection. Their excellent staging abilities were clearly spotlit when playing one of my favorite imaging and sound staging evaluation tracks. With the opening cut, Down Home Blues, from Harp Attack, four prominent bluesmen, Carrie Bell, Billy Branch, James Cotton, and Junior Wells, are lined up left to right, slightly behind the plane of the speakers. As these artists take turns soloing vocally and with their different keyed harps or harmonicas, their recreation was not only well-defined in both placement and size, but their locations were rendered with a sense of corporality that was spooky real and completely convincing. And mid-range tonality with the Grand Vivace is not just clearly and accurately rendered, it is conveyed with vibrant color, demonstrating a genuine expression of instrumental texture. This extraordinarily faithful tonality, especially when taken in combination with their remarkably believable sense of body, proves to be what I must proclaim to be an exceptional performance from a Class D entrant. I have noted that these textural and spatial attributes are usually somewhat more stilted with many entrants from this operational class, especially when compared to the more traditional Class A or AB linear amplifiers. In fact, I can only think of one other Class D entrant, the newest generation of amplifiers from the Netherlands Mola Mola, that can begin to share the Grand Vivace's liquidity and tone. 
Now, while their ability to present unreservedly natural tonality may be just a tad reticent when compared to that of class-leading devices, like the astonishing flagship VAC Statement 452 IQ music block monos, which are also more than eight times more expensive, the Grand Vivace still must be seen as offering a standout, almost singular performance in both its price and operational class. Uppermost frequencies are very well extended and are generated with a stirring sense of air, delicacy, and detail. Yet, they never drove my Ultra 9's hyper-revealing tweeters. One beryllium dome and one enforced sandwich diaphragm ribbon facing forward, and one aluminum magnesium alloy dome and a second identical enforced sandwich diaphragm ribbon recreating ambient spatial information on the rear of each cabinet to sound edgy or show any glare not recording specific anyway, to distort or to ring. Now, this is yet another clear strength for these monoblocks, as this has not always been the case with lesser class D entrants. Guys, it, it should be clear by now that class D will occupy a predominant role in our industry's future. Their efficiency alone is motivation enough, as we all try to affect a responsibly smaller carbon footprint. And as each new generation of Class D amplifier design narrows what I and many others currently see as the absolute performance gap between the current standard of linear amplification in Class D, we as audiophiles and music lovers will become more and more enamored and accepting of these new and remarkable designs. It seems clear to me that it may simply be a matter of time. That said, the degree of performance to price afforded by the AGD production Grand Vivace GAN monoblocks clearly deserves your attention. These are not only exceptionally good sounding amplifiers for their price, but they also represent an undisputable engineering advance in their approach to both design application and functionality. As such, they are quite arguably not only remarkably visionary, but precedent setting. Alberto's work is a shining example, clearly leading the way and setting the stage for what I see as the inevitable continuing ascent of this very promising and exciting class of amplifier. Again, my pointing out that they fall ever so slightly short of the near-perfect balance of resolution and effortlessness available from some of today's world-class monoblocks should be seen for what it was, the only real nit I had to pick with these beautiful, engaging monoblocks. Uh, to conclude, guys, their, their performance represents an exceptional level of accomplishment for both their operational class and price. As such, I need to be quite clear here. And while I cannot claim them to be giant killers, as I really don't believe in such beasts uh, in almost any category, and especially in amplification, I can tell you that you'll have to ante up considerably more coin to do much better. Most enthusiastically recommended. As always, thanks for taking the time to drop in. Further information on supporting the channel may be found in today's description section or at my website, theaudioanalyst.com. Please stay safe and keep the music playing. Till next time, cheers.